This tank chats about this massive beast beside me, the Yag Tiger, with its enormous 128 millimeter gun. Now, we've already explained about the development of the King Tiger project, and the Yag Tiger is a vehicle that comes out of that project. Uh, it really stems back to this German idea that starts just before World War II, which is um, to put, first of all, uh, an infantry support gun, such as a short barreled 7.5 centimetre gun, onto a tank chassis, but without a turret. Um, and the idea there, the original idea was called a Sturmgeschutz, um, but the Germans developed that with their different models of tanks. And with that initial idea of an infantry support vehicle, it then moves on when they add, instead of an infantry support howitzer, to add an anti-tank gun, then you end up creating something the Germans call Panzerjägers or tank hunters. Um, the idea of a vehicle that can have a powerful anti-tank gun on a mobile track chassis. Um, and the real difference there is between that and a tank is a tank tends to have a turret that can go 360 degrees on it. This particular Yag Tiger was captured uh, by the American forces at uh, just outside Haustenbeck, which is in the Haustenbeck Senna Lager. It was a training and testing area for the German military. Um, at the very end of the war, some of the vehicles that were training there were taken uh, to form a, uh, an improvised unit to help try and stop the Americans advancing. It was then taken back to Haustenbeck, and this was a vehicle that the British then recovered to the UK for evaluation. And we've repainted it in its original just Dunkel Gelb scheme, which is what was the case when it was at Haustenbeck, which is just, again, it was basically, this is the factory finish. By later in the war, two more colors were being issued for the various units to apply as a camouflage scheme. We know this vehicle was never camouflaged when it was in service, despite the fact it, it's, you can still see traces of the Zimmerit system in August 1944 when it was manufactured that were added at the factory. Now the Germans like this idea and pretty much every model tank they come out with, apart from Tiger I, they create some sort of tank hunting vehicle on top of it, sometimes by reusing uh, captured guns, French or Russian anti-tank guns are put on top of chassis sometimes, other times building something bespoke. So uh, for example with the Yag Panther, building up the sides and the front glacé plate, putting the 88mm gun on basically what underneath is, is a Panther hull. Now with the Yag Tiger program, uh, what happens is in October of 1943, Hitler's already likes the idea of continuing this tradition uh, with the Tiger tanks. There's an issue going on already uh, by the summer of 43, the Germans have seen how the Russians are using heavier and heavier calibre guns, sometimes anti-aircraft guns, sometimes artillery pieces, in an anti-tank role. And he looks at the idea of using the 128mm gun onto a tank chassis. Now Hitler, as we've mentioned before with the Tiger programme, he's already trying to see his armed forces a step ahead of the opposition for each summer's uh, battle seasons, as it were. So even though this sounds ridiculously, in 1942, a ridiculously large gun uh, in late 42, when they were thinking about, can we put this 128 millimetre onto something like an anti-tank gun limber, something in the ideas about, just like they've been doing with other anti-tank guns, or putting it onto a mobile chassis, this seems ridiculously big. You only have to think, a couple of years before, the standard anti-tank gun that Germany goes to war with is 37 millimetre, a little man portable, um, can be towed by horses or a small vehicle, um, can be manoeuvred into position, suddenly to jump to a, a vehicle or a gun of this huge size of 128 millimetre onto a chassis, they start designing one, it comes out at 11 tonnes. So they realise straight away that's just going to be too big and too heavy. They were also looking for the best 128mm gun to actually use. And they go to Krupp and Rheinmetall, as always in the German systems, you try and get a bit of uh, competition going. Rheinmetall is already making a 128mm flat gun. It's a standard calibre for some naval weaponry, so tooling and other things are out there. 
Krupp decides, no, we're going to have a go ourselves, but we're going to actually come up with a completely new gun of that calibre. And the Germans actually look at the Krupp gun as the gun they actually want to use in the anti-tank role. This huge gun, 128 millimetres, normally it would have some sort of barrel support on it. That gun in length is seven metres from the end to the breech. That is a very long gun, two metres off the ground, very heavy as well. So as the vehicle's driving, the vibrations that go through the structure that's holding the gun in place, the mounting for it that is attached to the floor, that wear alone causes the gun to become inaccurate because you get wear and tear there. Hence, they needed a gun lock to be able to put that locket into place. The gun is actually sighted through a periscopic system that goes through the roof. The commander would be sitting on the far side from me. Um, he actually had donkey ears to look through the roof as a, a binocular type of scope. Uh, whereas on this side, there'd be the actual aiming scope. And as I mentioned, and this could, gun could be accurate out to about three and a half kilometers away. Uh, again, a great distance for a, a tank killing weapon. Inside, we've got uh, a driver uh, and a bow machine gunner on the far side there who would operate the radio. Uh, and again, as I've mentioned, the two loaders in the rear and a gunner who sits in the front using that scope that goes out through the roof. So Hitler, as I mentioned, he likes the idea of the Jag Tiger. Uh, in October of 1943, they show him a wooden mock-up out in East Prussia. It's demonstrated as, as this is what it will look like. It's not a running vehicle. And they then get to work. And Henschel, who have got the contract for the King Tiger program, um, by the following April, of April of 1944, April the 20th, Hitler's birthday, they show they actually send two of the first completed Jag Tigers um, out to East Prussia, and again it's demonstrated. One of them is demonstrated for him. Now, part of that background, what they're really looking at here, with, with that 128 millimetre gun, and again, around as you look at the whole vehicle, that's the important thing about it. In the tank hunting capability, 128 millimetre, this is going to be able to destroy pretty much anything on the battlefield at that time. And this gun is so powerful, it could knock out any known Allied armour on the Eastern or the Western Front out to about three and a half kilometers away. It fires two main types of round. There's a armor-piercing ballistic cap round and there's a high explosive round as well. And these rounds are now getting so big, the, uh, the high explosive round alone weighs about 28 kilograms in weight. Um, so they're now doing two-part ammunition. So the round goes in far first and then it's followed by a cartridge uh, with a propellant in. Um, that cartridge, it's made of wound steel, think of something like a poster tube or a toilet roll, steel wound, cemented together, lacquered, and that holds the cartridge. And they actually have at least two different charge sizes in the cartridge, depending on the distance the gun's going to be firing. Now they get uh, to the point where they can put 38 of those rounds inside the Yank Tiger, but because of the weight of the rounds and they're getting so large, we now have the situation of an extra crew member. They have two loaders uh, for the Jag Tiger, one to put uh, the projectile in, one to follow up with that cartridge that's going to blast it out. So 128 millimeter, great tanking, killing capabilities. Um, will go through any known Allied tank um, out about three and a half kilometers. That is the most phenomenal tank killing gun put on a tank in World War II. The problems, of course, of what we're looking at, what the Germans have, is then mounting that on a chassis that then comes in at 75 long tons. We've got all those problems we've seen with the other big heavy German tank program, things such as the Maybach HL 230P engine, you can get about, they've pushed it to about 600 horsepower, it is still going to be underpowered for getting 75 tons around the place. Uh, and again, looking at, you know, you can just about get 12 miles an hour out of this vehicle. Transmission, again, back to the same as a King Tiger, problems with the transmission systems. Uh, in February of 1945, engineers are sent out from the factories trying to find a way of rectifying um, the transmission problems that so many of the vehicles are, ha are having. And we'll talk about that as well in its service combat. But you're looking at really this sort of a vehicle, 200, 250 kilometers, something's gone wrong, um, as in a major transmission failure. Uh, and from that point of view, 
With a vehicle like this, to remove the transmission in the front, that means a removal of the main armament to get at it. So that's a major project there. It's, it's not something they can do easily. For armour protection, uh, on the front of the vehicle, you've got about 225 millimetres of armour plate, angled at about 75 degrees, a huge casting on the front, and then an even bigger casting as well, which is what they call that Sauerkopf mount, um, to protect uh, the mantle, as it were, at the front around the gun barrel. Uh, this is homogeneous armour, it's not face hardened, uh, 80 millimetres on the side, so as always, thinner armour on the sides and the rear, but the idea behind it, Hitler likes the idea that if we're putting a gun on a vehicle, uh, what they're really looking for is a level of protection that would be up to that standard of gun that the vehicle itself is carrying around. So whether this would really have protected it against that sort of uh, firepower from this sort of caliber weapon, hard to say, but it is very, very thick armor. And the other issue, of course, that's actually going on is they've then got to find ways of welding that armor together. So there's very great big segmented sections in it to almost block together. But of course, we're not talking about Lego here. Um, they have to angle all the different jointing so weld can get in there and actually make a, a proper seal and adhere those different blocks together. And that in itself is uh, a major undertaking. They order 150 of these vehicles. We think by about uh, May of 1945, only about 80 of them are actually being completed an issue. They're made at the Nibelungen work in, uh, down in Austria at St. Valentin and that gets bombed quite heavily in October of 1944. So again, as with so many of the other later war German tank production, um, there's outside influences coming into play. Um, mechanically, we've already mentioned the problems there, so vehicles are constantly either being sent back or trying to be repaired in the field. Uh, bombing has interrupted not just the production of the tanks but the supply of raw materials and because you've got such a big vehicle it tends to be try they try and move it all the time on the rail network and of course from late 44 into 45 that is being heavily targeted um, by the Allied bombing campaign so getting these vehicles around Germany is a real problem and you've got that whole system of building German vehicles starting to break up as these vehicles are being manufactured. So this is, uh, again, another one of those stories of stop-start. Hitler showing interest throughout the production run. Uh, in January of 45, he's uh, questioning, could some of the barrels, uh, delays in barrel manufacture with Krupp, could barrels be taken off some anti-tank chassis? They've been using these French and Russian anti-tank uh, chassis to put this huge, great big 128 millimeter gun on. Can we take some of those back to help produce more Jag Tigers? Again, he doesn't want to see this Jag Tiger. This for him is another one of his wonder weapons, these secret weapons that he's hoping is gonna make a real influence. And when the first units are starting to train with these vehicles from September 44 onwards, the 653 um, heavy, or it becomes the Panzer Jaeger Ab Thailand, the tank hunting battalion. It's already started serving originally with Elephants and Ferdinands, moves on to these vehicles. They note the number of times senior figures come to see and have a look uh, at the new Jag Tigers, seeing how training's progressing, seeing how this vehicle's developing, because again, it's another one of these ones that Hitler's taken a, a great personal interest in. They don't actually see any action till the winter of 44-45. They were going to be deployed in uh, the Ardennes battle. They don't actually make it to the front line. And again, if you read the different accounts going on, it's not so much um, uh, allied activity. It's again, it's a rail network. Um, it's trying to get the vehicles to the right place. They fail to have any influence in the Ardennes battle, but the first losses, they follow up with Operation Nordwind in Je January of 45 and that's when the very first loss of one of these Jag Tigers takes place. Um, ironically, for such a massive vehicle, uh, one of the most advanced, powerful munitions of the Second World War, the first Jag Tiger, it seems, is knocked out by something as simple as a bazooka that manages uh, to enter and gain access to the ammunition from the point of view, and that sort of causes secondary fire. The whole vehicle, it blows up and loses the entire crew. Um, 
They do not see an awful lot of action in 1945. Um, the issue being, again, trying to transport them to where the fighting's going on. Uh, Otto Carius, a famous Tiger commander, he writes in Tigers in the Mud, when he's actually given command of a platoon of these Yag Tigers, um, he sees, he, he describes the problems they have just getting to the battlefields with something so big, keeping the vehicles fueled, um, looking out for, at this point, that dominance of Allied air superiority and also other issues we sometimes forget about from 1945 onwards. For example, there's a time where he positions his Yag Tigers, um, but then immediately locals have alerted the advancing Americans where those tanks are, so an airstrike comes in. Uh, other issues he's got, which again we mentioned in previous tank chats, uh, issues such as crew training. You can have this fantastically sophisticated bit of kit with that very powerful gun, but yet again, if you don't have the trained men that can actually make the most of it, and that's one of the things Otto Carius points out, he's got a, a Tiger, Yag Tiger commander, who again does a, a, a schoolboy error of retreating away from American troops where again he's actually managed to knock out an American tank but then he decides he's going to manoeuvre and that exposes his side armour that's thinner to the Americans and then he becomes a victim of their firepower as well. So uh, that idea about a, a less well trained and sometimes a less committed uh, German tank force uh, by the spring of 1945 is, is something that becomes prevalent and also it affects the losses of these vehicles. So you've got one unit, one of the platoons, actually they tot up that uh, 10 of their 12 Yag Tigers, they have to destroy themselves um, and they've only actually, they lose one Yag Tiger in combat and knock out one American tank. So again, we come back to the amount of time, energy and effort that goes into these vehicles um, for the outcome just doesn't seem to be worth it at the, for the German production and for the German, certainly for the German military. Uh, a second unit is formed. It only fights the Russians with the Ag Tigers in Austria in May of 1945. Uh, and we sort of mentioned we think only about 80 Ag Tigers get produced. And one other point worth mentioning here um, our dear old friend, we'd mentioned him again in his tank design throughout World War II, Ferdinand Porsche. Now, Porsche, with this vehicle, Henschel have got the contract to build it, but Porsche's got a contract from the German military, contract number 258, and that contract is basically saying, Porsche's saying, look, I can make you a cheaper, quicker, better suspension systems for German military vehicles. And that system is actually trialled on one prototype and 10 uh, of the original production run of the Jag Tiger, and our particular version here has that Porsche system on it. And again, it's another one of these indications of there's Germany losing the war, and yet still these other programs are going on um, to see if they can improve their tanks or make them better. Um, perhaps something we'd, we'd be thinking now, thinking is dissipating their resource, their time, their energy. But the idea was that what Porsche came up with, instead of the Henschel system of putting cross-member uh, torsion bars across the lower hull of the vehicle, so it's anchored on one side, runs across the floor, comes out, and the road wheels uh, uh, are on an arm on it on the far side. That's how it um, has its suspension system. Porsche comes up with the idea of using longitudinal uh, torsion bars that were on a housing that could be bolted to the side of the vehicle and therefore saving space inside. Now he reckoned the tooling would uh, be under half of that that was needed, very accurate toolings needed to actually do torsion bars. You're drilling through from one side all the way out to the other. Porsche says, no, you don't need to do all this. I can do all that cheaper. They trial his system on a number of these early models of the Yang Tiger coming out, including this one here. Unfortunately, it is from the German military's point of view, yes, it's cheaper, but it is not that successful. This Yag Tiger, one of the suspension systems has completely broken away. It was held on by, drilled in by studs onto the side of the vehicle. And there was another problem as well. Porsche's system had eight wheels. The Henschel system had nine wheels, but double wheels and interleaved. The Porsche system ended up putting too much pressure on the tracks. So they were finding the tracks were actually bowing and sometimes cracking as well. So again, another one of these Porsche novel ideas, 
there to try in this particular case save time, energy and money, it fails as does, you might judge, the whole of the tank. Um, from the Western Allies, um, who did fight the Yank Tiger the most, the Russians, just for a couple of examples, in May in Austria of 1945, um, thank goodness, from their point of view, most of these vehicles ended up being uh, destroyed by their own crews because either they'd run out of fuel, transmission failures, um, or they couldn't get them to where the battlefield was. The factory is uh, overrun on the 9th of May. The last tank is being built on the 5th of May. They've run out of the 128 millimetre guns. They put about half a dozen together just with an 88 millimetre, but we don't think they ever lost the factory. So overall, uh, one of those vehicles, it's looked at, uh, the gamers love it, model makers love it. Its impact on the Second World War, despite again being one of these pets of Hitler, is infinitesimal. As ever with these tank chats, we're only doing them because you're supporting us. So can I thank those of you who have joined our Patreon scheme or are supporting the Tank Museum in one way or another as an independent charity. Um, we just can't continue doing the activities we do unless we get public support. So please, if there's any way you can support us, Patreon's the obvious one to, we, we encourage people to go for, please do. And we hope you do still continue to enjoy these tank chats we're making.